Today on the Matt Wall Show, the Biden administration has hired an obesity expert to help craft new dietary guidelines. This expert says that obesity is a brain disease and there's almost nothing you can do to stop yourself from becoming fat. This is ridiculous, of course, but it's part of a larger and more nefarious agenda, which we will discuss today. Also, the media launches a ca- campaign against assault pistols. What are those exactly? A teen girl is sexually harassed by a man in the women's locker room at the YMCA. Now the harasser is speaking out to defend himself, and somehow I do not find his arguments persuasive. Plus, a famous track star claims racism and sexism after getting kicked off of a plane. Is she really a victim or just another cry bully brat? We'll talk about all that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. The current administration's New Year's goals are to tax, spend, and turn a blind eye to inflation. If this is at odds with your goals, if you're tired of the government playing games with your savings and your retirement plan, then you need to get in touch with the experts at Birch Gold today. For over 5,000 years, gold has withstood inflation, geopolitical turmoil, and stock market crashes. Now you can own gold in a tax-sheltered retirement account. Birch Gold makes it easy to convert an IRA or 401k into an IRA in precious metals. Text Walsh to 989898 to claim your, claim your free info kit on gold. And then talk to one of their precious metals specialists with an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Thousands of happy customers and countless five-star reviews. You can trust Birch Gold to help protect your savings. Text Walsh to 989898 and protect yourself with gold today. That's Walsh to 989898. Last week during our mailbag segment in the members block portion of the show, someone asked me to pinpoint the exact moment when the downfall of Western civilization began. Now, uh, my first answer to that question, which may or may not be naively optimistic, is that I'm not ready to admit that the downfall of our civilization has actually happened or is happening. We are fighting to avert such a disaster. And um, if I didn't believe that we could win that fight, I, I wouldn't bother with any of this. That said, we are experiencing, at the very least, a steep decline in nearly all senses of the term, civilizationally. But I don't think it's it's possible to locate an exact beginning point of this devolutionary process. We cannot say precisely when we began on this road, but we can, in retrospect, identify certain landmarks, certain signposts that we passed along the way, which warned of things to come, and yet whose warnings were not heeded. As for that, I mentioned... uh, In that segment, one moment that isn't often cited in conversations like these, and that moment occurred in 1952 with the publication of what would become the first of so far five editions of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders by the American Psychiatric Association. What made this moment significant in an ominous and very negative sort of way is that it was one step followed by many more increasingly larger and more rapid steps towards the medicalization of the human condition. The psychiatric industry had set out on a path towards diseaseifying every human emotion, thought, action, habit, and recasting the human species as pre-programmed and highly defective automatons, incapable of making our own choices or of claiming any sort of responsibility for our own emotional and mental states. By the publication of the DSM-5 in 2013, this process was complete, or perhaps not because there's always more that can be done after all. There are always more ways to relieve human beings of the burden of their own free will, which has become perhaps the number one mission right now of the medical community. It isn't just psychiatrists anymore who are working diligently on this project. Much of the rest of the medical industry has joined the cause. And this is especially evident in the way that medical experts now approach and treat obesity. And in fact, to bridge the gap between these two topics, We should note that a serious effort was made to add obesity to the DSM-5, officially categorizing it as a mental illness, the kind of thing that you would talk to your psychiatrist about, not a nutritionist, and then be given psychotropic drugs to treat. And by the way, they would be treating, of course, not the obesity, but your feelings about the obesity, which would then actually become the disease. The fact that you're obese and don't want to be obese, that's the problem. Let's make you okay with the obesity, and then we've solved it. It did end up getting making it into the DSM-5, but I'm quite certain it'll be in the DSM-6. Um, so, because we haven't gotten quite to that point yet. But we have arrived at the point where, as we discussed on the show a few weeks ago, so-called medical experts are officially recommending gastric bypass surgery and diet pills to obese children. Because obesity, they say, is a disease in its own right. Not something that you can or should try to control on your own. Um, it's entirely a disease. 
the medicalization of gluttony and sloth, which are the true causes of obesity, is now in full swing. One of the people at the forefront of this movement is a woman named Fatima Cody Stanford. She's a doctor at Massachusetts General Hospital, and she also works at Harvard Medical School. It's a very prestigious professional. And she recently added another prestigious title to her resume when she was named as a member on the 2025 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, which is assembled by the Departments of Health and Human Services and Agriculture. This committee, which will hold its first meeting in a few weeks, is responsible for releasing updated dietary guidelines for Americans, something they've been doing every five years since 1980. Now, you may be familiar with their work, because this is the same organization that published the now thoroughly debunked and ridiculed and infamous food pyramid, which was taught as gospel when I was in elementary school. This was just assumed that it was the way to go. Um, and they taught the food pyramid until actual nutrition experts pointed out that the recommendations on the food pyramid were ridiculous and wrong and extremely dangerous to your health. Its biggest problem, there were many problems with the food pyramid, including just how the foods are classified and how overly simplified it all is. But its biggest problem was that it recommended a diet consisting primarily of carbohydrates with almost no fats on the assumption that all carbs are good and all fats are bad. The developers of these recommendations were, by the way, persuaded in part by lobbyists for the grain industry to make grain the base of the pyramid. This is what convinced them that uh, the grain industry thought about, threw, threw a bunch of money at them. And then they said, you know what? I think grain is uh, great. I think that should, should be like the only thing people eat. This strategy of recommending that Americans eat whatever type of food has the best lobbying firms behind it apparently didn't have great results for the overall health of Americans. Indeed, as the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee continued to work and continued to publish newer and newer guidelines, Americans just continue to get fatter and fatter. There is no evidence that this government initiative is helping anyone and lots of evidence that it's hurting people, which only means that they'll continue doing exactly what they've always done and they'll get more and more funding to do it because that's how it works with the government as we have seen time and time again. And with Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford as one of the quacks at the helm this time around, there's no reason to think that the results will improve at all. Stanford, uh, a form, again, a foremost expert on obesity. She teaches a subject at Harvard Medical School. She's, got a, she's a doctor at uh, Mass General Hospital. And she says that fatness is, if not a mental disorder, then a disease of the brain. The distinction, by the way, between mental disorders and diseases of the brain is, of course, never made clear by anyone, like nobody in the, in the medical or psychiatric industry can even explain the difference between the two things. They constantly conflate the two, mental disorders and brain diseases. But she insists that, um, that diet and exercise have almost nothing to do with making you fat. She made this case uh, a couple weeks ago to a visibly incredulous journalist on 60 Minutes. Listen to this. If you diet, mm -hmm. you lose weight, right? The number one cause of obesity is genetics. That means if you are born to parents that have obesity, you have a 50 to 85% likelihood of having the disease yourself, even with optimal diet, exercise, sleep management, stress management. So when people see families that have obesity, the assumption is, oh, what are they feeding those kids? Mm -hmm. Those are bigoted assumptions. So she proposes that you could have a near perfect diet, you could jog three miles a day, you could never touch fast food, you could never touch fried food, you could eat no junk food, everything's great, and you will still have up to an 85% likelihood of being obese because your parents are. You may do everything right and still wake up one morning like Tim Allen in the Santa Claus, suddenly morbidly obese with a white beard and flying reindeer parked in your front yard. That's science, apparently. Though, despite how she presents it, um, of course, the reality is that obesity cannot be simply passed down to a child like eye color. It would never be accurate to say, well, I have my mom's eyes, my grandpa's jawline, and my dad's beer gut. If it was that simple, then, um, you know, if it, was, if, it, if it was simply passed down like brown eyes and pronounced jawlines are passed down, we should see morbid obesity at similar rates across the world and through history, but we don't. We see it here in this place at this time in history because people have never had more food to eat um, or more processed food to eat or more sugary food to eat. And they've also never been more sedentary. 
If we see obesity running in a family, it's not because mom and dad passed down their fat genes, unless by that we mean that a child is so fat that he's literally wearing his dad's pants. No, obesity runs in families because children will generally eat what their parents eat, and they'll follow their parents' example, and they'll sit for five hours a day staring at screens if that's what their parents do and allow them to do. And the the inherent contradiction here is that, of course, if people like Dr. Stanford are involved in creating any sort of dietary guidelines at all, then they must acknowledge that your diet plays a very important role. What's the point of the dietary guidelines you're working on if the diet doesn't matter? Why would we even be discussing diet if it's just a matter of genetics anyway? It It would be like issuing dietary guidelines to help Americans change their blood type. It's a total contradiction. There's no solution to the contradiction. Like so many other contradictions from the so-called expert class, this, is, this one is left to just hang out there and hope that none of us will notice it. And as for that expert class, it must be said that the, the laughable claim that obesity running in families is proof of an obesity gene, this is exactly the kind of bad science, the kind of propaganda masquerading as science, that has made people totally distrust nearly everyone in nearly every profession related at all to science. We have reached a critical mass, no pun intended, and the public simply cannot endure any more lies from the science and medicine expert class. We can't deal with it anymore. We can't listen to any more of it. And more and more people are getting to the point where they're saying, I don't want to hear, I don't believe anything you people say anymore. We've had enough. There's only so much you can take. But it's important to realize what this particular lie is meant to accomplish. accomplish. Indeed, most of the lies from the medical industry have this same goal, and it's the goal I mentioned at the top. The objective is to turn you know, people into fat, pathetic, helpless, rotund little roly-polies waddling around from place to place, mindless and thoughtless, driven by instinct and easily herded in whatever direction our betters want us to go. They want us to believe that we have no control over our lives, over our minds, over our bodies. Self-acceptance, self-affirmation is the highest virtue in our age because self-acceptance, in the way that they mean it, is defeat. That's what it is. It is admitting defeat. And they want us defeated and submissive. Simply accept your current mental and physical state. Make yourself comfortable with it. Satiate yourself. uh, Distract yourself. Numb yourself by engaging a lot of, of, you know, uh, by just watching things on TV and looking at your phone a lot. Because you cannot change. And you cannot choose. And you cannot do anything for yourself. That's the message. But of course, if you really don't want to accept it, if there's something about yourself that you really don't like, well, then the next option is to take drugs and get surgeries. Because remember, it's all a disease. Whatever it is you don't like about yourself, it's automatically a disease. Whatever it is, it's a disease. So it's not your fault, which is why you might as well accept it and even embrace it and be proud of it. Or you could treat it as a disease and go get medicine for it. Another contradiction. Medicine or surgeries, which they'll be happy to provide, of course, for a hefty fee. So that they can be richer and you can be poorer. So we're going to add that to it. Poor, fat, helpless, and miserable. That's their vision for you and for me. And a vision that we should all certainly reject. Now let's get to our headlines. The Daily Wire doubled in size during 2022, and that fast growth is not stopping as we head into 2023 and are hiring for several different roles already. If you need to hire for your business and you want an easier way to find qualified candidates, well, you got to head to ZipRecruiter.com slash Walsh and try it for free. ZipRecruiter uses powerful technology to find the right candidate for your job. See a candidate you like? Well, you can easily send them a personal invite so they're more likely to apply. Their user-friendly dashboard makes it easy to filter, review, and rate your candidates all from one place. Um, Let ZipRecruiter help you find the best roles for all 
Bless people, best people for all of your roles. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. You can see for yourself how easy it is. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Walsh to try ZipRecruiter for free. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash W-A-L-S-H. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Like we talked about yesterday, the Monterey Park uh, mass shooting is not terribly useful to the media um, now that it turns out that their um, anti-Asian hate crime narrative doesn't really hold up. So they'll, of course, try to make it a gun control thing, and that's what they're doing right now, before they move on, because the gun control narrative, unfortunately for them, doesn't drive ratings nearly as much as some of these other narratives do. But on the topic of gun control, I thought this segment on MSNBC, this was yesterday, um, was notable for how how much absurdity they were able to pack into, like, I think this is about two minutes and let, let's listen to this. We choose to live like this. It doesn't have to be this way. We choose to live in a country. And, and this one of the guns, at least one of the guns, I want to play the sound um, so I get this right. But it is it is believed by the L.A. County Sheriff um, that one of the guns w- was probably not legally possessed by the shooter. Let me play that sound for you. The weapon that we recovered at that second scene, I'm describing as a magazine-fed, semi-automatic assault pistol. Not an assault rifle, but an assault pistol that had an extended large-capacity magazine uh, attached to it. I believe the weapon that was recovered at the Alhambra location is not legal to have here in the state of California. So, Frank, it's uh, the scenario Shannon describes um, precisely. Um, And so while the solution seems to be slowly and incrementally working Mm -hmm. in places where elections succeed in putting in place politicians who do smart things to make us safer, until we're all safe, no one is safe. This was a gun probably purchased somewhere else. As the sheriff said, they're not um, legal to have in California. Shannon's uh, right on the money with regard to this weakest link observation. Uh, Replete on social media right now are people saying, look at that. California has some of the most strictest gun laws in the nation, and even they couldn't escape a mass shooting. Well, yeah, that's right. Because you know why? Because you're only as good, as as Shannon says, as the the next nearest state with the weakest gun laws. We need a national federal solution here. And it doesn't have to be just banning all guns, but we've got to act regionally and nationally. Hmm. So there's a few things to go over there. Um, and they, like, as I said, they packed a lot into it. But so first of all, we have this phrase assault pistol, uh, which is a new one to me. I'd heard of the uh, assault rifle and I, I, I was never clear on what an assault rifle. I don't know what an assault rifle is. I, nobody knows what an assault rifle is. An assault rifle, well, okay, I know what an assault rifle is broadly. An assault rifle is whatever type of rifle uh, the media finds scary, which is really all of them. So, so then I guess context clues, assault pistol is a, a pistol that is particularly scary to the media and to the left, which again is all pistols. The, the whole, I, I mean, putting the word assault, I, I know, in front of a, a weapon, it, it's like, what, yes, any weapon can be used in the course of an assault. It can be used to assault somebody. But then again, any physical object, well, maybe not any, but many physical objects, those that can be, that are hard or solid, can be picked up and wielded in any sort of way, um, those can also be used in an assault. Certainly a knife can be used. So is there an assault knife? Your hands can be used in an assault. That's the vast majority of assaults that happen uh, throughout the country every day. Somebody using their fists. So do you have assault fists? So that's the first problem. And then then we hear this statement from the anchor there where she says, well, you know, nobody is safe until we're all safe. If we aren't all safe, then nobody is safe. What? No, no, no. That's See, that's not how this works at all, actually. <laughs> that's definitely not how this works. I'm not quite sure what you are even trying to express there. Until we're all safe, nobody is safe? 
No, your, your safety, look, nobody is 100% safe. If you're a mortal being living anywhere on the planet, you're not 100% safe. There's always, there are always dangers lurking out there around every corner. Um, but you can definitely increase your relative safety. Um, and that's going to, to begin with, be dependent on where you live. It depends on location. So where I live, I'm going to be a lot safer than someone who lives, for example, in like the worst parts of Los Angeles. The worst parts of Los Angeles being the entire city. So I'm going to be a lot safer where I live. There are people that can be a lot safer than me if they live all the way out in the country. That's an even safer place. So your, your safety, if you're living out in the country and you've got uh, 15 acres of land and, you know, there's nobody around, um, the, the chance of you falling victim to violent crime, unless it's violent crime coming from inside your own house, like a domestic thing, but the, the chance of you falling victim to uh, violent crime from someone outside of your own household is practically non-existent. Whereas if you live in uh, certain parts of many cities, your chances are sky high. But your own, your, your own safety living out in the country with your 15 acres, that's, uh, that's not dependent on everyone else being safe. Why is she saying this, though? Well, then we get it from the other talking head that they brought on who said that, who said that well, uh, if, you know, there, there are some states that have stricter gun laws than others. California has very strict gun laws. It's acknowledged by the law enforcement official in the press conference that the type of firearm that was used to carry out this mass shooting is already illegal in California. It could not, it cannot be made more illegal. They, they can pass another law making it illegal again, but that's going to be redundant. If the first law making it illegal was, was not totally effective, then the second law probably won't be either. Which, that in, of, in and of itself should put an end to the gun control narrative for this crime. Because you, you want to make it about gun laws. Well, whatever gun law you would propose that would have supposedly stop this, that's already on the books in California, and it didn't stop it. How do they get around that? They say, well, there are other states that don't have these laws. And they're the, they're the weak links See, now we're all, all the states now are links in a chain. And if you don't have, if your laws are not as tyrannical and oppressive as the state next to you, then you are now the weak, weak link. Which means that this is not, they're not just using this as a platform to launch an attack on the Second Amendment. Uh, they're also, of course, using this as an attack on states' rights. That we all have to be on the same page. We all have to have the same laws. Because if California has certain laws and they're not working for California, but you're a neighboring state and you have different laws, then, well, they can just turn and blame you. So it's all your fault somehow. And then what happens? What happens when all that we, we, we totally abolish states' rights, which are mostly fictional and have essentially been fictional really since the, the end of the Civil War? We abolish states' rights. Let's say they pass whatever federal gun ban they want. Still doesn't solve the problem because people are still getting guns. And well, then what do you do? Now you look at, at the, the other countries of the world and it's their fault. Well, now we need a global, now we need global laws, which, which obviously is the next step. All right, here's a, there's a report from Daily Wire. Let's back up a few days to get this story and then we'll have the update. Um, a female California teenager in San Diego County told local officials Wednesday that she was exposed to male genitalia inside a YMCA women's locker room after finishing a workout. Rebecca Phillips, 17, said during the public comment section at the January 11th Santee City Council meeting that the exposure happened two weeks ago after she completed swimming laps and cleaning up in the uh, Cameron Family YMCA women's locker room. As I was showering after my workout, this is a Phillips quoting, said, I saw a naked male in the women's locker room. I immediately went back into the shower, terrified, and hid behind their flimsy excuse for a curtain until he was gone. Phillips said that she asked YMCA management about the facility's transgender policy, and she said the Family Recreation Center confirmed to her that staff allowed the man to shower wherever he pleased. Uh, Phillips told city officials, as long as you're not a red flag on Megan's law, 
California Sex Offender Registry, a grown male can shower alongside a teenage girl at your YMCA location here in Santee. I was made to feel as though I had done something wrong when I talked to people at the YMCA. So this was a this, this was a male pervert who uh, was fully naked in the women's locker room around uh, minors. And one of these girls complained and was made to feel like a bigot for complaining. The phrase victim blaming gets thrown around a lot. And, and usually in circumstances where it's not at all appropriate. But he, this is, if you're wondering what victim blaming really looks like, this is what it looks like. It's this. You have a female, a minor, who was sexually harassed by a naked male in her locker room. She complains about it, and she's treated like a bigot. Essentially, the message to her and to every woman and every girl is, hey, if you don't want uh, naked men around you in your locker rooms, just deal with it. Go home. Don't, don't come here anymore. This is, this is your problem. So that's victim blaming. And, you know, also, by the way, sexual, the term sexual harassment is thrown around quite a lot. Yesterday in the Daily Cancellation, we had examples of women who were, you know, working out at the gym, recording themselves, and then claim that they're harassed because a man briefly looks in their direction or, God forbid, tries to speak to them. And that becomes harassment. That's not, though. On the other hand, a man getting walking into the women's locker room and getting fully naked, that's sexual harassment. That's what, that's what that looks like. And it looks hideous. Speaking of looking hideous, the uh, local CBS affiliate has an update to this report. And they, the, the, the guy who went to locker room, he's been talking to the media. He's very proud of himself. has no shame. Let's watch a little bit of this report. People, entire families were coming up to get their picture taken and to introduce me to their children. And Wood is not done fighting. She's planning to speak next Wednesday at the Santee City Council meeting. It's important that they finally get to hear the truth and they finally okay, get we pause to put it, a- Just pause it for a second. Because this is... I mean, th- this is literally just an out of shape Dennis Rodman. I mean, this is like uh, if Wesley Snipes had a baby with Elton John. And this is the dude that's coming into the women's locker room. Not even, once again, not that it matters, of course, but this, is, this doesn't qualify as even dressing like a woman. I, have you ever seen a woman that dresses like this? He's dressed like a, a homeless circus clown. This is not, no, no woman looks like this or dresses like this. Again, not that it matters. Even if he was really pulling off the look, it wouldn't make it okay to be in the locker room. But he's not doing that much. Let's keep watching. Face on this scary transgender woman who was misgendered. And despite threats of violence, Wood says she's not scared. You know, I I know how to give an insult out and I know what areas to kick and punch. You know, at least enough to be able to run till I can get to my car and get out of here. And at the meeting, she'll have the support of her Aqua sisters. Um, my husband and I are thinking about putting some signs together that say we support Chrissy so that we have, you know, the visual. Friendship through thick and thin. Austin Grab is joining me now. Austin, I feel like a big part of the story that's either been a misconception or people are just forgetting about is that Wood has fully transitioned into a woman and was in the woman's bathroom. Yeah, that's right, Wale. In fact, she says she is a woman and she really wants to drive home the fact oh, she that she says transitioned it. over five she says years it. ago. Um, and that, you know, she, he says it. She, is a, she is a woman and, and she says she's a woman, period. And yeah. that's where it ends. Absolutely. And let's transition ourselves into the other side of the story, oh, that 17-year-old oh. girl. Well, he said it. What are we hearing from her? Yeah, interestingly, he said it. Well, that's I did it. not see he Rebecca said it. Phillips here last night at the protest, and I have tried to get in touch with her. I left a message yesterday at her workplace, but I have not had a, a phone call back. Certainly, we would like to speak to her, but I haven't heard from her, and I haven't heard any more public comments from her. It will be interesting to see if she comes out to that city council meeting next week. Certainly, she's already had her voice heard there. Now, Wood is going to have her voice heard there as well. It would be interesting to see if the two were there at the same time. Absolutely. You you definitely want to hear from that 17-year-old and how she's even responding 
responding to the protest. Austin, thank you very much. You're Let's welcome. dive deeper into that part of the story and how this incident got into the public limelight last week. That 17 year old girl that we were just talking about, her name is Rebecca Phillips. She got up to speak at okay. the Santee City pause Council meeting. Pause, pause it again. Um, I don't know how much longer this goes on. So they're remarking on the fact that they can't get a hold of the 17 year old girl. And both of these, both of these, uh, so-called journalists there. So, oh, we tried to get a, a hold of her. We, we can't get a, she's not talking to us. I wonder why. I wonder why she's not talking to us. I don't know. 17-year-old girl being smeared as a bigot by the media. Like, you, you've already come out against her. You, you're right now coming out against her by affirming this pervert male as a woman. How do we know he's a woman? Well, because he says so. And they think that's really important to clarify. Just to clarify, you know, uh, this person says says she's a woman, period. Said it. That's it. It was said. So that's all. Fully transitioned, where we're, we are informed. He fully transitioned. This is a full transition. So what else are we supposed to say? There's, uh, there's, this. That's it. That's the period. They put the end of the. They said period. That's the end of the discussion. So after saying that, then they called the 17-year-old girl and said, hey, by the way, we're with the media. Uh, we wanted to know why you're such a disgusting bigot. Hey, can you give us a call back, 17-year-old girl, and let us know. We want to know why are you such a transphobic bigot that's going to cause this poor trans woman to kill herself. We wanted to know more details about your bigotry. Please give us a call back. These people are beneath contempt. Utter scum. And that's, you know, and I'm, I'm even angrier as always at the, at, at everyone else in this that we've seen, you know, in this story. I'm angry at everyone else, even aside from the guy dressing up as, as a woman. I mean, he's the number one culprit, culprit, of course. He's a pervert predator and should be in prison for sexually harassing minor girls. He should simply be in prison for that for the rest of his life. This is not someone that we need in society. He's not doing anything to help society. We don't, we don't need him. And so we should just throw him in a cage and lock it and keep him there at a minimum. But then you look at everybody else. I mean, how, the, we, we heard from the woman. It's like an older woman. Imagine being like you're an actual woman. Okay, you are you're a, a real woman. And you see, you hear a story about a man disrobing and exposing himself to a 17-year-old girl, and you take the man's side? All right, let's watch a little more of this. In sparking the debate, here's some of what she had to say. As I was showering after my workout, I saw a naked male in the women's locker room. I immediately went back into the shower, terrified, and hid behind their flimsy excuse for a curtain until he was gone. I was made to feel as though I had done something wrong when I talked to people at the YMCA. Somehow, the indecent exposure of a male to a female minor was an inconvenience to them. I mean, I, I, how deranged do you have to be? We just saw, they only gave us a, a, you know, a short snippet of the 17-year-old girl, but you've got, you've got her on one hand, and even in that 10 seconds they show of her address at the city council meeting. We can tell that she's a 17-year-old girl, normal person, who had to witness this hideous, disgusting excuse for a man disrobing in front of her, and she was quite traumatized by it and afraid, as any 17-year-old girl would be, as any woman would be, as any, any, any female would be in that situation. So you've got her on one hand. On the other hand, You've got the Dennis Rodman look like. Again, how deranged do you have to be? Like, in what state does your soul have to be in to see these two people and come to the conclusion that the dude is in the right, that you're on the dude's side? But what makes it really evil, you know, this is my point, that what makes it really evil is that I don't believe that anyone actually does think that the guy is in the right. I, I just, I don't believe that. The, the two news anchors or reporters that we saw there, I, 
I, I don't think that any of them are looking at this guy and thinking, well, yeah, that's a woman, all right. That's a woman if I ever saw one. None of them think that, but they're going along with it for ideological, of course, political reasons. All right. Similar uh, subject here. It's a report from the Daily Wire. United Nations Women's Rights Committee rejected a pro-life organization's request to screen the Daily Wire's What is a Woman after declaring the groundbreaking documentary did not align with the panel's values. The Committee on the Status of Women, um, referred to within the global body as NGO CSWNY and a convener for the United Nations Annual Meeting on Women's Rights, rejected the International Youth Coalition's request to hold a screening of the film starring Matt Walsh at an upcoming conference because it did not adhere to their new guidelines. So this is a, the, the UN at this committee associated with the UN. Uh, they're saying we, you can't screen what is a woman because it doesn't adhere to their guidelines. Uh, the letter turning down the proposal said, unfortunately, your request to host an event has been denied as your event does not align with NGO CSWNY's values and or mandate. The summary rejection stunned Austin Roos, president of the Center for Family and Human Rights, the Youth Coalition's parent organization. He, uh, he said, quote, how, how ironic is it that a conference on women does not want to consider the question, what is a woman? It's also unfortunate that this UN conference is not interested in diverse voices. Now, obviously, nobody is surprised that the UN uh, is, is not interested in having my film screened. Uh, I don't think anyone's surprised by that. I'm not surprised to learn that it doesn't align with the UN's guidelines. I agree, in fact, that it does not align with their, with their, with their guidelines or their values. In fact, I would be, I would be embarrassed. I, I, would, I would be, not just embarrassed, I'd be, in sh- I'd be ashamed if they, if they were actually allowed to screen it. If the UN said, oh yeah, that, we, we have no problem with that one. Yeah, that, uh, that, that adheres to our values. I probably, I think I would retire from the business. I think at that point, I, I would have to. If I found out that I made a film that adheres to the UN's guidelines, I would have to retire in shame. So in a certain way, I'm quite relieved that they turned it down. Um, but that doesn't change the irony here or how absurd it actually is. That this is a, keep in mind the, the name of the committee or the conference. It's not, it's not simply a committee for women or whatever. It's, it's a committee about the status of women. That's what they're interested in, the status of women. And so if we want to examine the status of women in the world, then probably the first question we need to answer is, um, what are they and do they exist to begin with? That's a, if, you're, if you're trying to figure out anyone's status, the first thing you need to know is whether uh, that person or that type of person exists. And that's something that, that's a, that is, at a, at, at, at a minimum, a live question on the left. They're not quite sure. Not quite sure if women exist to begin with in any kind of meaningful sense. But that's not a question that they want to, obviously, examine at the UN. Another report from the Daily Wire I think is important. In one generation, the world has experienced seismic shifts in the way we communicate and relate to one another, but these changes are coming at a high cost, particularly to our children. Uh, most teenagers, 97%, report being online every day, and nearly half say they're online almost constantly. But recent research from scientists at the University of North Carolina shows that all of this time on social media is linked to changes in the teen brain. By looking at brain scans of middle schoolers between the ages of 12 and 15, Neuroscientists at UNC found that frequent social media users at age 12 uh, showed heightened sensitivity to social rewards from peers over time. Teenagers who were less engaged with social media at age 12 showed less interest in social rewards over time. Jean Twang, a psychology professor at San Diego State University and author of iGen, has also sounded the alarm on the link between social media use and anxiety and depression in teens. There's a substantial link to depression, and that link tends to be stronger among girls. The more time the teen, particularly a teen girl, spends using social media, the more likely it is that she will be depressed, according to Twang. Any new habit or learned behavior leaves its imprint on the brain. The fact that the brain is imprinted by social media use should not come as a surprise, but most parents who let their children create social media accounts are probably unaware of the extent to which these social media accounts are training their children to seek peer approval or what the long-term consequences may be. Um, so this, this is just the latest bit of scientific evidence that it is not good for children for them to sit around all day staring at their phones. Remember, 50, and I think the number's probably low, but according to the latest data, latest surveys, 50% of 
teens and adolescents say that they're online constantly. And by constantly, and anyone who's ever been around a kid in this category knows that constantly really means constantly. Like, they're never not on. They sleep, and then they wake up, and they're staring at their phone the entire day. No matter what else they're doing, they have their phone, and they're looking at their phone. Um, I don't think we need, we certainly have, have never needed to wait around for scientific evidence that this is not a healthy way to live. And I don't, need, I don't need any scientific analysis or any study to tell me this is not a healthy way for kids to live. The only thing, the only thing that science will do is tell us in precisely what sort of ways it is unhealthy. So we know that it's extremely unhealthy, and we can figure out a lot of the ways that it's not healthy. Um, driving the obesity epidemic is one thing. That's the least of it. But then science, I suppose, can come back around and get a little bit more specific. Give us some of the details. None of these details are surprising. This is not, this is not a, a it's, it's not even a human existence. The human beings were not meant to live this way. And whenever we can look at the way that we're living our lives right now, you know, this is this part of learning from history and learning from our ancestors. And I know people these days, they want to pretend that our ancestors and uh, have nothing to teach us and nothing to tell, tell us. We want to sever ourselves com- entirely from our ancestors Um, not listen to the testimony of those who came before us, but that's a very foolish way to live. And if you were to listen to them, then, you know, you you should look at the way you're living and and, um, you you could ask yourself, like, what what is it about modern life that would be entirely foreign to our ancestors? And just because it'd be entirely foreign to our ancestors doesn't mean that it's necessarily wrong. There's a lot of modern medicine, at least the legitimate parts of it, that would have been foreign to our, our, our ancestors. Antibiotics would have been foreign to them. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't take them. But having a little device that you carry around all the time and having your entire life center around this device, that is one of those things that is unprecedented in history. There's no analog for it. Many of the things that we think are unprecedented in modern history when you look at it, you see that, well, this is just a version of something that existed before. Nothing new under the sun, as it says, as we say. Actually, there are some things that are new under the sun. Smartphones and the internet are new under the sun. There is no analog for it. Nothing comparable to it, historically. This is an entirely new thing. It might be one of the only entirely new things. And so this is an entirely new thing that we have decided to completely structure our lives around. That in and of itself doesn't make it wrong, but it is a reason to examine it and say, hmm, no one's ever lived this way before. Is, are we on, you know, we are, we are verging off a completely different path. Is this the right thing to do? I think in this case, it's obviously not. And clearly when your kids grow up on this stuff and all they ever do is, is use the internet and their whole life is structured around it, as they found in the study, I mean, among other things, makes them a lot more susceptible to peer pressure, a lot more susceptible to influence, uh, much more desperate for approval and affirmation. Kids already are inclined in that way. They, they need approval and need affirmation. That's not, that's not an unhealthy desire for a child. But for kids that are on social media, this is their entire life. You got to, I mean, you, you just, you ha- I, I could keep saying it a million times over and I will continue to say it you have to rescue your children from this you just must you can't you cannot you must force your your children to have real childhoods and to live real human lives you know um, and they're they're not going to like it if you've allowed them to use the phone up until now and you take that stuff away and if you allow them to play video games 6 hours a day and you take that away they're not going to like it at first it's it's they're going to react like a, a heroin addict we need to take the heroin needle away, but but it's for their own good. Um, you just ha- you, you just have to for their own sake. All right, let's get to our comment section. Do you know their name? They're the sweet baby gang. Joshua Van says Matt Walsh literally just said we should assume the shooter was black because it was a crime against Asians. Wow, let's not mention most mass shooters are white. LOL. Wow. I'm glad you're impressed. Uh, 
No, I, I said that if we are going to assume the race, if we are going to assume the race of the Monterey Park shooter, as many in the media did, then statistically the most probable assumption would be that he's black. Turns out that he's not black or white, he's Asian. Um, as for most mass shooters being white, again, uh, unfortunately, you're wrong. A, a mass shooting is defined as a shooting where multiple people are hurt or killed. That's what a mass shooting is. Now, you're going based on the definition of mass shooting. Your definition of mass shooting is basically the types of shootings the media pays attention to. And if that's your definition, then yes, the majority of those are carried out by white people. I mean, almost 100% of them, like 95% are carried out by white people, the ones that the media pays attention to. But that's not the actual definition of mass shooting. Mass shooting is, is just multiple people being hurt or killed. And when you define mass shooting that way, which is how law enforcement agencies define it, then the majority of those are carried out by black men, uh, by a wide, wide margin, by the way, not by white people. That's, again, a statistical reality. Uh, Recrat says, Matt, I cannot put up with this grifting anymore. I'm sick of having to pay for Daily Wire Plus. I'm sick of the ads. I will settle for no less than you showing up to my front door and telling me what you have to say personally and paying me for my time. That is... That is one potential business strategy. I'll, I'll run that up the flagpole and see what they think. Um, Julie says, Matt, I think you're eventually going to surpass Rush Limbaugh in popularity. I look forward to it. Uh, no, I, I, <laughs> I won't. And no, here's the thing. That nobody ever will. Um, no one will ever be. There's not going to be a, you know, after Rush Limbaugh died, there was, of course, this conversation about who's the new Rush Limbaugh? Who's going to take over? Who's going to take the banner and be the, and, um, there's not ever going to be, Rush Limbaugh, first of all, is a singular talent um, at a particular time in history, revolutionized his industry of talk radio, and uh, it's a different world now, um, and there's not ever going to be another one. That's, that's it. Um, U.S. Marine says, Matt is the only person I know that hates cake as passionately as the no pineapple on pizza crowd. It's impressive, honestly. Well, that, that's not quite fair. I, I think I, I, I don't hate cakes. Yeah, this, is, this is the misconception, okay? I've already said I'll eat cake, obviously. If someone offers me cake, I'm going to eat it because the only other option is to say, no, I don't want any cake, which who would ever say that? So I'll eat it. Um, speaking of obesity, I'll eat whatever junk food you put in front of my face. But it's not, it, it's overrated, it's vastly overrated, Why, and, and, and it doesn't deserve the pride of place that it gets, is my point. Um, Orange Banana says, Matt, now that we've settled the pie versus cake dispute, how about this, yogurt or pudding? How is that a dispute? Like, would anyone choose yogurt over pudding? You, you could choose yogurt or pudding. Is anyone going with yogurt? It's arguable whether you should eat yogurt, even if it's the only option. Yogurt is kind of gross. It tastes a little bit like worms, especially Greek yogurt. Um, but there's, there's no contest there at all. Glock Tech says, it's so nice to hear Matt pronounce Latinx as Latinx instead of Latin X. The word itself is an abomination against Spanish gra grammar, and the latter pronunciation just further attacks on the Spanish language because X isn't pronounced as X in Spanish. The Democrats and their woke culture purport to be the tolerant ones, but the non-Hispanic who compromise so many of their ranks presume to, uh, who, who comprise so many of the ranks, presume to tell actual Hispanics how to speak their own language. The lack of insight is egregious. Yeah, I don't even, it's like even conservatives, when they're making fun of the Latinx thing, will, will themselves pronounce it Latin X, but you're already giving the left too much ground when you do that. I won't use their false pronunciation even when making fun of it because that's not like, lat how would you pronounce, if you want the word Latin X, then I guess you'd have to spell it L-A-T-I-N-E-X. Like maybe then you could justify Latin X, but L-A-T-I-N-X is Latinx. That's how you pronounce that. Um, and... Finally, Harry Logman says, brilliant episode. I think the girl in the second video in the cancellation had seen other guys staring in gym videos and was expecting the same thing to happen. 
She had been thinking about this hypothetical situation and was angry already before a guy used his eyeballs to look vaguely in her direction, a terrible crime for him to commit. I'm lucky enough to see the best side of women every day of my life, but this is one of life's irritations, a certain type of woman spending hours trying to look as attractive as possible and then blaming men for looking at them. Some women do this all the time. They want men, women, uh, men to behave in one specific way only, and anything else is harassment. It's irrational, yet some people take this nonsense seriously. Yeah, I think that might partly, exp- actually, I don't think that's really the explanation. I, I don't think that either of the women in these videos were actually upset. I think this is a trap. It's the whole part of the reason why they're recording themselves at the gym. Um, and I know women aren't the only, I see this sometimes, I see this sometimes myself at the gym, not just women, but men recording themselves too. I don't get it. I don't know why you need to do that. And if you really do feel the need to do that, you feel like you want to record yourself working out, then you, know, you could stay at your house for that. that. That's one thing about recording yourself in a public place. It's annoying to everyone, and it's strange, but also there are other people who are now in the recording who probably don't want to be, especially at a gym. Most normal people, the last thing they want in the world, is, unless you're getting paid as a fitness instructor, instructor, the last thing you want in the world is to be on video when you're working out. So I think this was just a trap that they said. I don't think she was actually authentically angry at all. But either way, they were the bad guys and deserve to be canceled. Jeremy's Razors is offering a great deal that ends soon. 40% off on all razors. Why the discount? Well, I'm glad you asked. A year ago, when Joe Biden tried to force a vaccine mandate upon private employers and some 85 million Americans, the Daily Wire told him where to stick it. We sued the federal government and won. After a 6-3 ruling in our favor from the Supreme Court, the mandate was dead and together we kicked the government's ass. So on the first anniversary of this tremendous victory for all Americans, the Daily Wire CEO and God King Jeremy Boring has issued a special decree on the razors that bear his name right now and only for a limited time. All Jeremy's razors are 40% off. That's right, 40%. That means you can get a kit with a Precision 5 razor and flip back trimmer, shave cream, post-shave balm, extra blades, and a handy travel case for just $35.99. That's a savings of just twenty of uh, $24. The Biden administration and its totalitarian cronies were cut down, and now we can rejoice by drinking their tears, enjoying our freedom, and looking damn good while doing it. Get 40% off Jeremy's Razors before the deal ends by going to jeremysrazors.com. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Today we cancel Shikari Richardson. You may vaguely remember the name as someone who was uh, complaining a while ago about being persecuted for some reason or another and supposedly was all racist or somehow or something. All these controversies bleed together in the mind and it's hard to keep them straight. So to clarify, Richardson is the female track star who was disqualified from the Olympics a couple of years ago because she tested positive for marijuana. And many people, including Richardson herself, complain that the rule against marijuana use is absurd and pointless as marijuana is not likely to give you an advantage in competitive sports. This is probably true, I guess, but me being the victim blamer that I am, I I always more so wondered why she would use marijuana when she's in the middle of qualifying for the Olympics, given the fact that it's a banned substance. It, It may not be necessary to ban it at the Olympics, but it's even less necessary for Olympians to use it. And if I was hoping to compete in the Olympics and the Olympics had a rule outlawing the consumption of anything. Like if they had a rule outlawing the consumption of Cheez-Its before competing and they had a test to determine who had used Cheez-Its, I'd be severely disappointed. I'd be confused. I wouldn't agree with the rule, but I still just wouldn't eat the Cheez-Its as difficult as it would be to abstain because it would be more important to me that I get to follow my dream and compete. But that's just me. So she chose to sacrifice the Olympics so that she could smoke weed. Um, That makes her the moron. And that's really the story there. It should have been. But Richardson became famous for not racing at the Olympics, a famous victim of Olympic rules that apply to everyone, but somehow were personally oppressive to her specifically. And given that Richardson's primary claim to fame is her victimhood, it perhaps is no surprise that she is, or at least became, a totally insufferable brat. Which leads us to the latest update in the Richardson victimhood saga, where now she finds herself kicked off of an American Airlines flight after refusing to stop using her phone before takeoff. She recorded two videos documenting this confrontation with the flight attendants and other people on her flight, apparently convinced that she comes off as the good guy in the exchange. But you can judge for yourself. Here's the video. 
Place it all the way under the seat in front of you. Lying. Larger carry-on luggage. <laughs> Flying not working today. If you have small vacation time, such as cell phones, tablets, and smart watches, okay. please yeah. switch them. I'm recording me, but you jumped yeah. in my video, so I caught if you because you jumped in my video. Your seat. You're harassing me at this point, so I think you should stop. I think you should stop. I think you should stop. You see him, right? Y'all see him, right? Y'all see him, right? Okay. Okay, but I'm sorry. It's not me. Okay, talk to him. No, no, man. Don't talk to me like that. I'm an adult. Do not talk to me like that. Do not talk to me like that. Tell him to stop. If you do not know what's going on, do not yell at me. You can stop recording. No, I'm not going to stop recording because I was making a video to myself. I'm going to not stop recording. And this video will show what you're doing. So I appreciate Who the f are you talking to, man? Thank you. Like, no. <laughs> I, again again with the, the taking the video in public thing why are you why are you taking a video to begin with on your flight who no one cares that you're you're on a flight you're, you're taking a flight no we've that's not interesting why do you think that needs to be documented not everything needs to be documented okay we don't need we don't need documentation especially not all the documentation anyone does anymore is of their face is a selfie or a selfie video here's my face on a plane Here's my face doing this. Here's my face walking down the street. Nobody cares. It's not interesting. And I know that I sound like a hypocrite because I am in front of a camera every single day. But that's also my job. And I can tell you, even in my job, like, it, it trust me, you see too much of me as it is. It could be a lot worse. I mean, all the time, I've got social media, the social, social media team here telling me, oh, you should do this video doing this or that. We need a selfie video of you doing this. I'm not doing that. No one needs to see that. It's it's not interesting. Like, I, give me a reason why I should be on camera. Some reason, and I'll do it. But we don't need. You don't need to have your face on camera every second of the day. Okay. Now, in the second video, which I won't force you to watch, she argues with another passenger who rightly blames her for holding up the plane and making him miss his connection. She chides him for um, not being chivalrous and, and you know, not standing up to defend her against the intimidating flight attendants. And he responds to her by saying, and I quote, I don't give a <laughs> which is both an eloquent argument and the morally correct one in this situation. Eventually, Richardson is escorted off the plane while the other passengers applaud. But the fact that nearly everyone on the plane was against her and that she had inconvenienced over 100 people for no reason at all was not enough to convince her that she was herself the villain of this story. Instead, she posted both videos to Instagram while threatening legal action against the airline for committing the crime of, I guess, expecting her to follow the rules that everyone else has to follow. This is a theme for Richardson, right? She, she, she really has trouble with requirements that apply to everyone. You don't have to like the requirements, okay? But they apply to everyone and no one else has a problem. Everyone else manages to follow them but you. Why is it a problem for you? Everyone else managed to not smoke weed before they have to, had to go race in the Olympics. You had an issue with it. Everyone else manages to like not be taking a selfie video right before takeoff. For some reason, you can't handle that. Indeed, she is personally injured by these requirements. The requirements are an attack against her. Not against everyone else who's just as subject to them but against her because she is her. She is Shikari Richardson and she is the protagonist in the story of the human species. Now, fortunately, I don't have to go to great lengths actually in this cancellation to explain why Richardson is in the wrong because it would seem that most people are on the same page on this one. Somewhat shockingly, this is the part that surprised me. Richardson has not garnered much public support even after playing both the race and gender card after the fact. An Instagram post that uh, diligently avoids anything resembling punctuation or proper sentence structure, Richardson wrote in part, tell me if I'll be wrong to pursue legal actions against the airline, American airline. Not only did the man threaten me, but also an innocent bystander who simply just wanted a picture with me. In the beginning of the video, you can hear a Caucasian male state that he doesn't give a F as a man that male flight attendant is intimidating a woman. Also, the captain not doing anything to help the situation, and this flight attendant has the applause when I exited the plane, when I'm pretty serious, the disrespect I receive would not have happened if I was a one, if I was a one of them. I, I, I don't know. Um, one of them as in a white male, I guess is what she, she meant to say. Because of course, everyone on the plane would have been perfectly happy to miss their connecting flights if only the disturbance had been caused by a white male. I mean, I'll never forget the time it's actually happened a couple times when I uh, I threw a temper a random temper tantrum in first class, 
delayed the plane by 45 minutes, caused 32 passengers to miss their connections. And everyone in the plane, um, they were so proud of me, they shook my hands one by one to thank me for it, while the flight attendants showered me with free flight vouchers and extra bags of complimentary peanuts. That is a thing that definitely happened in real life and not just in the fevered, marijuana-soaked mind of Shikari Richardson. Anyway, in this case, her victim routine seems to not be resonating as much as she had hoped with the public. It, it could be that the public has become suddenly intelligent and discerning, which seems to be, Frank, extremely unlikely. Or it could just be that people are simply sick and tired of loud-mouthed crybabies with main character syndrome who always seem to find problems and drama in the sorts of situations where everyone else manages to get along just fine. Fine. It's perhaps interesting to note that even as the public becomes increasingly and unreasonably tolerant of self-victimizing drama queens who look for every you know, opportunity to be oppressed, they still don't want to deal with it on an airplane. People these days will put up with your shenanigans in almost any situation that is until your shenanigans might cause them to miss a connection in Chicago. That seems to be where the line is drawn. And it's good that the line is drawn somewhere. And that is why I must say, indeed, I think we all say that Shikari Richardson is today canceled. And that'll do it for this portion of the show as we move over to the members block. Hope to see you there. If not, talk to you tomorrow. Godspeed.